How can someone grieve the Holy Spirit? Turn to Ephesians 4, verse 30, and let's just take a look at the verse that that question comes from. Basically, it just says what I asked in reverse form. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, the warning that we get in this verse, and it is a warning, is directed towards people like you who have believed, people who have been baptized and received the Holy Spirit. Now, God is aware aware of and watching the actions and the thoughts of all humanity, everybody. However, at this stage in human history, in this age, this era, as the scriptures say, he has special care and concern for those that he has called to receive his great gift of eternal life. So this is a warning for the disciples of Christ. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit and prepare to receive that gift of life. To grieve, to grieve. Well, to grieve means to sorrow, or to cause sorrow, I should say. To cause sorrow, to cause distress, or emotional pain, to bring emotional pain. The one causing the sorrow in this scenario, the one causing the distress and the emotional pain is you, or me. The sorrow and the distress and the emotional pain is felt by the Holy Spirit, which is Christ living in you. The scriptures, of course, speak of the Holy Spirit as being grieved because that's the living Jesus Christ, active and present within you. And he is grieved sometimes by what's going on in there. (laughs) What's going on in there? We often, and I think prefer to, speak of Christ's presence within us as our advocate, our helper, and we think of him in those, you know, positive, proactive terms. Uh, But his presence within us also makes him witness to everything that we say or think. And that sets him up nicely for being our perfect and righteous judge, the only one who has all the info and can make that assessment. But it also creates the opportunity for him to feel sorrow, distress, and emotional pain. Turn to 1 Corinthians 4, if you would. Verses 3 through 5. Paul writes here about the whole idea of this you know, judgment angle that I'm looking at. And he says to this congregation, and he's talking here about himself, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. And he's talking about his Lord and your Lord, Jesus Christ here. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Jesus' judgment is a total 360 evaluation. You know what that means? Everybody know what that, anyone not know what that means? It means it's going to be all-encompassing from every angle and every direction. It's going to be a 360-degree evaluation of you. Now note, at the end there, it's talking about receiving of praise. This is the judgment that uh, that will take place to establish the reward, or the praise, if you will, given to those who are marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit and who are raised from the dead at his return the day of redemption. Back up a little bit, and let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 3, on that note, verses 12 through 5. I guess judgment was on Paul's mind when he was writing this. Because just in a few paragraphs earlier, he says, if anyone, verse 12, 
builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, that day, will bring it to light. And it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though as only one escaping through the fire. Now, let's turn to 2 Corinthians, okay? 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 and 10. So we make it our goal to please him, to do what's pleasing, what it pleases him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So the presence of Jesus Christ, your living and active high priest within you, has many different uh, facets to be looked at. Helper, advocate, judge, and also grief. Now you might ask, and I, I, I ask, does God really feel grief? Does God really feel grief? I think the idea of God feeling grief sometimes is a little hard for uh, some people to square. I mean, look, God is all-powerful, okay? All-powerful. Everything is within his grasp. And from our human perspective, we might assume that that means that nothing that we humans can do, say, or think will ever affect him. But I propose to you that that's just a matter of us humans projecting our thoughts and our way of thinking on God and saying, you know, I think I understand God. He's, he's probably a lot like me. And I think that's a false way of thinking. Because that means that we're putting our own ideas about what God is, who he is, and how he feels about things on him, rather than accepting him as he has chosen to present himself to us. Let me explain. Fear. Rejection, longing, sorrow. Does anyone enjoy those? No. We don't like those feelings. I don't think there's anybody in the room who is going to say they like those feelings. They are unpleasant. Very unpleasant. What causes them is usually something that is outside our control things that we as finite human beings with limited power, ah, we can't fix that. And they cause us grief, you know, fear, rejection, longing, sorrow, and so forth. Often the source of that is other people as well. And we don't like the whole idea of not being in control. So I put it to you that from a human perspective, it's possible for us to think, well, look, if I, if I were all powerful, how would I set things up? Well, I'd probably set things up so that bad stuff could never affect me. If I were all-powerful, if I could make myself an all-powerful being, it's totally hypothetical, of course, I wouldn't want to have those negative emotions, would I? No. No, I wouldn't. So, from a human perspective, it's a sensible, I think, rational thought to think, yeah, well, you know, hmm. It only makes sense that an all-powerful being would have set things up so that he, she, it, whatever, could not be affected by any of these things. And it's, I think, a very common way of thinking of God as untouchable. Uh, nothing, nothing upsets God. So this supreme being... Well, they could, they could set up the universe and reality where they control all things. 
But of course, then that would have the negative effect of denying freedom of thought and freedom of action. An all-powerful being could set up reality such that they shut out all emotions, which is a goal, if you look into it, a goal of um, most Eastern religion and many, if not all, human philosophy to remove emotion from the equation. Because a lot of times, humans think of emotions as fundamentally negative. A lot of them are unpleasant. And then there's this idea that God is some sort of universal intelligence, you know, out there, the mind of the universe, which I, I always think of as the Albert Einstein mode. That's kind of his, what he thought of God, that God was math or whatever. Untouchable, unmovable, just logic out there in the universe. But all of these concepts of God and reality, all supreme, these are just constructs of the human mind, the way we would set things up. And they're dead-end solutions, and they offer a really bleak vision of life and of reality. And we'll touch on this again a couple of times. They show forth the futility of human thinking. Gladly, though, your creator, my creator, has a different way of seeing things. Go to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verse 8. I'm going to read down to verse 13 just to, because I, I like this section here. But the first verse is the one that really nails this concept. God speaking here says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth, and it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose that I have sent it for. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. And the mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. God is a being who can know and does know, and I think we see, wants to know emotions. And he says, his ways are not your ways. And your way of thinking about God, and I think, you know, I hope that most of us here in this room have thought this through, but not everybody has. But God is a being who can know emotions. If you could not know emotions, you would not be able to experience joy. Now, let's go to Genesis 6. Again, looking at that question, does God really feel grief? Or is he just a cloud of intelligence floating out there somewhere beyond Pluto? Genesis 6, verse 5. This is talking about the wickedness of the world before or in the times of Noah. And God saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. He experienced emotional pain. Some translations say that. Emotional pain. Because they've read the definition. <laughs> and that's what it says. From the very beginning, of course, we're going back to Genesis here, and we're looking at chapter 6, but from the very beginning, God has presented and continues to present himself as a being, if you want to use that word, who is emotionally active and alive. Emotionally active and alive. And one of the many things that Jesus accomplished, and he accomplished all kinds of different things, main thing, of course, being 
his sacrificial death, but he also came to show us the Father, which meant to show us God. And he said, if you want to know more about what God's like and, and you know, what the Father's like, look at me, right? That's what he said, didn't he? He said, look at me. I am the stamp impress of, of God standing right in front of you. I'm here and I'm going to, sh through living, I'm showing you more about what God is like. And Jesus showed emotions, did he not? Jesus showed himself as an emotional being. He was not like some cold, detached guru who sat up on a mountain and, you know, just hummed all the time and was completely disconnected with emotions. No. He showed indignation, wrath, sorrow, affection, joy. So part of his revelation, if you will, of what, what God's like and what God's all about included emotions, good and bad. I'm not good and bad, I shouldn't say bad, but um, happy ones and sad ones, <laughs> let's put it that way. So what causes God to grieve? What causes God to have sorrow and emotional pain? We looked at Genesis 6 and we read that when God saw the evil doings of, of people who were on the earth, he also saw or knew that every inclination of their thought and of their hearts were only evil all the time. So God can be grieved by what we do and by what we think and what's going on in our hearts. Let's go back to Ephesians 4. You might want to put your ribbon in there because we'll come back to it repeatedly. Ephesians 4. And take a look at the verses surrounding our um, topic, if you want to call it that, our topic. How can someone grieve God? So we were in verse 30. Let's take a look at the verse right before it, verse 29, all right? Ephesians 4, verse 29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk or any corrupt communication come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. It was touched on a bit in the opening message uh, and it's amazing, I think, it's amazing to me at least, how much emphasis the scriptures put on what you say, what you do with your, with your lips and your tongue, you know, what you, what you talk about. Great emphasis in God's word from beginning to end. Jesus Christ emphasizes it, the apostles, the Psalms, the Proverbs, and the prophets all place emphasis on the words that we speak. And perhaps, and I think this is uh, an easy, easy speculation, perhaps that's because the words we provide, the, or sorry, the words we say provide the clearest window into the heart. Go to Matthew 12, keep your little ribbon in Ephesians, but go to Matthew 12. Verse 33, Jesus is talking to a, a number of people who consider themselves very religious, but uh, are not very nice people. And they're not, they're not, uh, they're not showing their religion by what they, they say or do, <laughs> like the first message was about in James. In verse 33, Jesus says, make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. And then he says to them, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man 
brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word that they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. We might say things like, and I'm, I'm just basing this off personal experience, not with any of you, but over, over the years, uh, we human beings might say things like, oh, well, you know, she didn't really, she didn't really, um, she doesn't really think that. She's just venting. So, you know, don't pay too much attention to it. She's just venting. I know her heart, and I know she feels differently. Or you might say, oh, I didn't mean to say that. I, I didn't mean to say that. I was just joking around. <coughs> Sound familiar to anyone? But for the person who hears them, and especially for the person who says them, words may be an indication of what's really going on in there. Now, Ephesians 4, verse 29, doesn't give us um, a bunch of concrete examples to look at of corrupt communication or rotten talk. If you, if you look at the definition of the words, it's rotten talk. Corrupt, rotting, like a yucky piece of fruit on the ground, bleh, covered with insects and worms and junk. Rotten talk. But we can figure out a few things by looking at the, what's there in the verse and the not that but this formula that you see there. The not that but this. We are advised to avoid corrupt communication, rotten talk, and to stick with talk that builds up, helps and benefits others, brings, bringing joy and pleasure, grace, as it says. Uh, I think it says that in the King James, New King James as well. And Therefore, we can logically assume that corrupt communication is talk that does the opposite, that tears people down, that hurts them, and is contrary to their best interests. Let's take a look then, go back to Ephesians 4, and let's take a look at the verse after verse 30, where we started. So verse 31, verse 31 tells us, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, slander, along with, it, along with every form of malice. I took all these in various translations, and I looked at the definitions and so forth, and uh, want to share some of that with you. In this verse, following our warning about grieving the Holy Spirit, we're told to get rid of some some stuff, some specific things. You know, bitterness, wrath, anger, fighting, slander. You know, every translation's got a slightly different take on how to translate those words. Let's consider these in the context of corrupt communication, if you will. Corrupt communication or rotten talk. And also as matters of the heart. The first one was bitterness, bitterness. And bitterness means, it, it's, a word is pick, or pike, or something like that. It's sharp, and you use it to poke at things or stick things. It means pointed, sharp, and cutting. That's what bitterness means, or bitter means. And when used literally, it could be used to describe a harsh, unpleasant taste, or a harsh, unpleasant smell. But scripture uses it in a variety of different ways uh, to describe what I'm going to call spiritual matters as well. Uh, one would be in James 3, um, James 3 verse 11, which says, Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. He's using the same argument that Jesus was earlier. 
And it goes on here and it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from, wis from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. So here we have an example of extreme and negative jealousy or envy. Now let's take a look at another example of, of bitterness. Uh, Colossians 3 verse 19. Mm. This one, I'm, gonna, I'm reading from the NIV, um, and it says, Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Now, some translations probably say bitter, because that's the word that's used there, bitter. Husbands, love your wives. Don't be bitter with them. And I think this is an example where it means harshness, mean, cruel. The opposite of gentle, which, you know, if we, when we go back to Ephesians 4, we'll see that. So we've got two types of bitterness here. We've got um, envy and harshness. Um, I look at envy as being something that's directed upwards, you know, someone who's in a superior position to you, you're envious of them, or someone who's got something you want and you, know, you might be reaching out across. Whereas what we see about husbands and wives, and husbands, you know, you're in the, the position of authority, don't be harsh mean, cruel. It's like how you treat people who are subordinate. Don't want to take that too far, but going in both directions. No matter where you are on the, uh, on the ladder of life, you have the opportunity to be bitter. You can be bitter this way, that way, or that way. Another mentioned is anger. Anger. We're told we're warned against this. And uh, there are two types of anger. And if you read through whatever translation you're in, you'll see it just says anger and wrath. And it sounds kind of repetitive. And you think, well, you know, what's the difference? Anger, wrath, it's the same thing, right? There are two types of anger discussed here. Two types. Uh, first is uh, passionate wrath. And the word there is thumos, which means hot. You know, I'm angry. And you know, sometimes your anger just comes out, Wah! and you're mad, and it just happens. It's happening right now. <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, so there's thumos. There's thumos, and there's that type of anger, extreme and negative, ugh, a sudden out outburst of, say, indignation. I can't believe that's what's happening. Now, there's another type of anger, and it's what I'm going to call slow burning anger slow burning anger and the word there is orge o r g e right there are two different words orge and that means something different this is like a thought out um, lasting feeling like you might have if you were plotting revenge i i'm going to get you and that's a different kind of anger. Both of them were warned against. Another one is fighting, right? Um, the word there, if you look it up, uh, clamor, some um, translations will say clamor, but it literally means crying out, outcry. Like if there's a tum tumult in the back of the room, people are arguing loudly about things. Outbursts like that. Controversy, argument. And then the last one, um, where was it there? It said uh, slander, slander. And here we're looking at, I think, more the actual content of what it said, which means hurtful things said about another. The word is actually blaspheme. If you look up the words underneath in the Greek, it says blaspheme. So you blaspheme another person, which uh, if you break down the word, um, it just means hurtful talk. And that's attacking someone's reputation or character. So let's, let's take the first point, which is bitterness, okay? Bitterness. Now, for the most part, you or I, I can't really tell if another person's bitter unless they open their mouth, right? You don't know about bit, a lot of bitterness until someone starts talking. And you might not even realize that there's bitterness 
in you until you start talking. Until you express it and the words come out of your mouth. And to figure that out, of course, you have to listen to yourself. Now, the same holds true for all the other points. And I put it to you that watching your words, which is spoken of so often in Scripture, we, the first message, it was not planned, it was about watching what you say. Watching your words is a tool. It is a tool that God gives you to look into your own heart. And when you listen to yourself honestly and listen to what you say, what's really coming out of your mouth, you can use that perhaps to identify things that are going on within that need to be addressed. Because sometimes we're not terribly honest with, with ourselves about how we feel and the, you know, the things that are going on under the surface. But once we've said it and it's out there, if we use it to our advantage, it can help us deal with situations or problems within. And I would, I would add uh, to be on top of your self-talk. Your self-talk. You know, a lot of us think in words. And so there's all this conversation going on in your head. But what's being said? And if you listen to it, what does it say about who you are and what's going on in your heart? Now, if the Holy Spirit is in you, and all this stuff's happening... If the Holy Spirit is in you, which it should be, that means the living Christ is in you. Working to bring forth a creation of a new spiritual being, a new spiritual creation, equipped with the mind and character of, of God. If rotten talk and attitudes grieve the Holy Spirit, then Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, who is present within you, is going to urge you to correct the problem. Because it's grievesome to him. But you have to actively listen to and then follow the prompting of the Spirit, which is Christ working in you. Go to Romans 8. Verse 5, it says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit, or following the Spirit, or living according to the Spirit, is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God and does not submit to God's law, nor indeed can it. Those who are in the realm of the flesh can't please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, then they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, and even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So to make this spiritual creation happen, the work of Christ in you, we have to listen to and then follow the promptings of the Spirit. The antidote to bitterness, wrath, anger, uh, contention, and slander, and all those things that grieve the Holy Spirit, the antidote is to imitate God, to imitate God, which we accomplish by imitating Christ. 
That means, that means that you have to know how Christ spoke. And you have to know how Christ interacted with other people. And to do that, I'm going to give you, a, I'm going to give you an assignment. Read the Gospels. To know how does Christ deal with people? How did he deal with people? What is his example? All the scriptures are relevant on that point, but the most direct, of course, would be in the Gospels. And if you haven't started this massive project, that's the place to start. And, but don't, don't leave out the rest of the scriptures. But start there. The antidote is imitating Christ. And once you know the pattern of his life and his thoughts, then do likewise until it becomes a habit. And then from there, a new way of thinking. All right, digging deeper. Let's dig a little deeper, okay? Words, a little superficial sometimes. Examining your words is a tool. I'm putting it to you that it's a tool that we can use to see into our heart. All right? If we decide to use that tool in a right and godly way, it can be very helpful. But just saying the right things is not the goal. Not the goal. That's not the point, to just always have the right words on your lips. Because it is possible, it is possible to say only uh, smooth and pleasing things, that uh, you're always polite and uh, you never show your anger to someone, but you can still have it in for them. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever met someone like that, but some people can manage it. I, I'm not, not as skilled, I, I don't think. I, I don't, it's not a skill that I want. But you could say all the right things. You could be smooth and pleasing, and no one could, you know, butter wouldn't melt in your mouth, right? And you can still be a terrible person. You know that. And the Psalms have, uh, there are a number of Psalms where David talks about that, you know, butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. And we went to God's house together, but he had his knife drawn to stab me in the back. Right? You've read that. So words can be very superficial. All right? On some levels, words mean everything. But on another level, words mean nothing. That's why I chose to characterize them as a tool. You can use it. You can use it for good. You can use it for bad. Um, you can use a hammer to drive a nail in, or you can use a hammer to bash somebody's head in. It's a tool. Depends what you want to use it for. <clears throat> now, that kind of talk, even if it's pleasing and self-controlled, that too grieves the Holy Spirit. the Holy Spirit of God within. Go to, back to Ephesians 4. Let's take a look at verses 25 through 28. Okay, Digging a little deeper here. <clears throat> Looking at the context. Digging a little deeper. Verses 25 through 28. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, to one another, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Let's break this down. Let's break it down. Verse 25. God does not like deception. I hope that's not a surprise to you. <laughs> God does not like deception. And this, I hope, you know, you've connected the dots, harkens back to the previous scenario where butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. But he was not a square dealer. God does not like that sort of stuff. God does not like deception. A person who says the right thing but does the wrong thing, mm -mm, that is not pleasing to God. A person whose words are smooth and pleasing but 
who perhaps leads other people into dead-end philosophies and ways of thinking, false doctrine, so forth. Many of which call what is wrong right and what is right wrong, don't they? And in that way, they are deception. What is wrong is right, what is right is wrong. That, too, is not pleasing to God. Both grieve him. I'll give you a test here. You can look this up. There's a scripture in Proverbs. Look it up. And it says, God hates lying lips and a flattering tongue. God does not like deception. So you can be, you can be all covered in milk chocolate on the outside, but totally rotten on the inside. And God knows the difference, and he doesn't like it. So you can, and, and for us, okay, because this is saying uh, members of one body that's talking to the church, you can master church talk. Anybody know what I mean when I say church talk? You can master church talk. You can be artful, graceful. Church talk, you can, you can master that, but not be converted within. Mastering your tongue, as was mentioned earlier, and you know, throughout scripture, is only the beginning. It's a good start, and it needs to happen. And it's an excellent tool, but it's the beginning, and it's not the end. If you've been able to exert the required um, mental discipline and mental focus to regulate your patterns of speech so that they can reflect godly values, why not take it to the next level? Why not take it to the next level and put that same mental discipline towards changing your thoughts and actions? Your words, of course, give you an opportunity to look into yourself. Your self-talk goes a little deeper, perhaps. And you can use these tools. Verse 26. This talks about, In your anger do not sin, and do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Again, talking about talk, words, how they mean everything, Sometimes nothing. God does not like unresolved dispute. Doesn't like unresolved dispute. And that's what this section here on anger is getting at. Holding grudges, maintaining feuds. Now, you might be able to choke down what you really want to say to that other person, right? Hold it in. I'm not gonna, not gonna say this. And that's, that's a beginning. That's a beginning. You know, hold your tongue. Excellent beginning, okay? Unless, of course, your uh, snake in the grass is just waiting for their opportunity to strike. Okay, that, that's a possibility. We've just addressed that, okay? But to please God, to, to please God rather than to grieve God, and to go to that next level... Be forgiving. Reconcile. Seek reconciliation. And make peace. And these are the ways that you go to the next level. Beyond just controlling what you say. To be forgiving. Seek reconciliation and make peace. That's how we deal with anger. That's how God recommends we deal with anger. Both the slow-burning kind, that or gay, as, as I mentioned, and then the rash, impulsive kind of anger as well. So let's take a look at verse 26. And it's got both kinds of anger mentioned here. Go and do a word study on it. They're both in there, or gay and thumos. It says, don't let your or gay, your slow-burning anger, and it's kind of just waiting for its opportunity. Don't let your or gay draw you into sin, which would, for a great example, would be revenge. Don't let that draw you into sin, this slow-burning anger. Then don't let the sun go down on your thumos, your rash outbursts. So if you've done something rash or stupid or you've said the wrong thing, 
Scripture is just telling you, okay, deal with it quickly. Don't let it fester. Don't, don't let it wait till the next day, lest it turn into something worse. Deal with it quickly. So both kinds of anger are dealt with here. Okay? Don't let it fester so that it turns into a grudge or a feud. Deal with it quickly. Your father and creator likes reconciliation, loves reconciliation, and he likes issues to be settled and resolved. Unresolved grudges, feuds, and stuff like that, they can lead to violence. God hates violence and other acts of revenge and so forth. These grieve the Holy Spirit of God within you. His constant exhortation is to forgive one another, to forgive one another, as Christ has forgiven you and reconciled you to God and made peace. This is what God likes. And when we're headed in the other direction, it grieves. It grieves God. The Holy Spirit is grieved when that's what's going on within. Okay, verse 28. You might have thought, how's he going to deal with verse 28? It seems like a non sequitur. Verse 28. Uh, anyone who has been stealing must no longer steal but work, doing something useful with their own hands so they might have something to share. All right. God does not like covetousness or laziness. God does not like covetousness and or, well, both, laziness and covetousness. Consider that Paul here is writing to who? He's writing to a church congregation. He's writing to a church congregation. Do you think that the problem in the church congregation was that they were walking around swiping one another's credit cards out of their purses while they were sitting in church? Or maybe when they went over to each other's homes for dinner or something like that, they were pocketing the silverware? Do you think that's what he's getting at? Why is he talking to the church about this kind of thing? Well, there are, there are a number of different ways to look at it, and I've looked at some of the others in the past, but... I put it to you that perhaps Paul here is shining light on people who are always taking from others. Someone who is always taking from other people. Okay? And he's exhorting them to, basically he's saying, get a job so that you too can be the one who helps others. Okay? Covetousness. Covetousness isn't covetousness. I mean, you could have different definitions at different moments, but couldn't you say that covetousness is wanting things that are not legitimately yours to have? We tend to think of covetousness as a sin of the rich, right? A sin of the rich. To be covetousness. But isn't someone who wants the fruits of another person's labor without being willing to work covetousness as well. Isn't that being covetous as well? I think it is. And from end to end, God's word teaches generosity. Generosity. That's what God wants. That's the antithesis, if you will, of covetousness. Generosity. A lot of these, if you trail them back, they all go back to the commandments. Covetousness. But God teaches generosity. And helping others in their time of need is part of the mind of Christ. Definite. Oh yeah. Helping others in their time of need is the mind of Christ at work. But God's purpose is not to enable people who refuse to work. Uh, who always want to be on the receiving end. That's not God's purpose and that's not where God's coming from. We need the whole picture whole picture. God's purpose, God's purpose is that you and I help others get back on their feet, isn't it? When you read through the scriptures, isn't that what God really wants and instructs? We looked at gleaning. Remember we looked at gleaning last week? That is a process that God put in place to help other people, but to help them get on their feet, get back on your own feet, have a sense of dignity and pride and so forth. God helps you and blesses you, but 
you don't wake up every morning to find that all your chores are done, the, the rug's all vacuumed, the floors are all sweeped, the dishes are all cleaned, and you think, wow, what a great day, the sun is shining. That is not how life works, is it? God helps you and he blesses you, but he doesn't take care of all that, pay your bills and stuff like that. No, God's blessings usually come in a form, not always, but usually come in a form that provides you the opportunity to earn your way. That's how God works. And you want a blessing? You know, God, bless me. Well, it's probably not going to be a bag of cash falling out of a window on your head. It's probably going to be an opportunity to get a job and an open door to go out and get a job, you know, income. That's how God works, from what I've seen. Because the mind of God, that reflects the mind of God, because the mind of God is active and involved and uh, radiating out good things for others to enjoy. And he wants you to be like him in that way. That's what he wants for you. So that you become that. And I hope that's what you and I want. Because laziness and covetousness grieve the Holy Spirit of God within you. Okay. Digging even deeper. Let's dig even deeper. Uh, we're in Ephesians, right? You're in Ephesians. Let's take Ephesians 4. Uh, that would be verse 17 through 17 through 21. So this is going back in the context here and taking a look at another thing, even deeper. Paul says, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Remember I talked a bit about that earlier? The futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him according to the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This section is um, very similar to what you read in the first chapter of Romans. Familiar with the first chapter of Romans? Should be. If you're not, you should be. First chapter of Romans, which... Um, says in a different way, more elaborate, elaboration on the theme, that even though the values of God are self-evident in creation, that we're all part of, most of humanity has chosen to reject what can be known about God and go their own way. Cross notes and compare it to uh, Romans 1, verse 18 through 32, when you have opportunity, all right? Darkening of their understanding and hardening of their hearts turning away from what can be known about God, going their own way, they do not hold God's values in high esteem. And in both cases, in Ephesians and in Romans, the result, the immediate result that scriptures focus in on is sex. Sexual immorality. Now, we're not talking about, um, I believe, momentary lapses or slip-ups. We're talking about a hardening of the heart here. We are talking about constant practice, habit. And I would add, add to that human reasoning that convinces itself against all evidence that's out there that this is the way. This is the way to live life. A hardening of the heart convinced that their bad behavior is actually good behavior. Does that sound familiar? If not, let me give you a few examples. Bad behavior reclassified as good behavior. Abortion. Directly linked to sexual activity, is it not? Uh, divorce. I think it, in a person's own mind, uh, sexual abuse, they must rationalize it some way. And I've heard people in, in uh, 
popular news rationalize terrible sexual practices. Well, this makes sense, you know, it's right, because I feel this way. Um, any and all sexual relationships outside of marriage. These grieve the Holy Spirit. These grieve the Holy Spirit of God within you. And I, I'm, you know, I, I know Paul had to talk to uh, the church in Corinth about that. I, I'm not aware of, <laughs> I'm not aware of anything in, in Raleigh, but it's something to be aware of. And I just wanted to make sure that we covered the whole context of Ephesians here. And if that is part of your life and part of your thinking, and it needs to be dealt with. Well, then deal with it, because it grieves the Holy Spirit. Okay, we are still in Ephesians. Let's take a look at some of the wrap-up there in Ephesians 5, uh, verses 1 through 6. It says, starting back in uh, 32 of, of the previous chapter, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even the hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of these you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, because such a person is an idolater, has inheritance in the kingdom of God and of God. And let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord, and have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Use that tool. Use that tool that we talked about. Examining your own talk, self-talk, and so forth. Expose them by the light so that they are visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. And that's why it said, wake up, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Why does God grieve? Why does God grieve? I have a son, and I have two daughters. And I, I have what I think is a very natural desire to see my children accomplish certain goals in life. Uh, I want them to establish a line of work that they can do well in. I want them to start their own families. Even that they aspire to the resurrection of the first fruits at Christ's return. And these are the sort of things that you, you know, they're, they're good to hope these things for your children. If I see them making bad choices, if I see them making bad choices or heading down a path that takes them in the opposite direction, I'm grieved. I'm grieved. God looks upon you the same way. He grieves when he sees any of his beautiful, created children heading down a path that leads away from eternal life and the everlasting joy that he wants to share with them. 